Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Madmouth, and I am pleased to be joined by Russell Branham. And, you know, Russell and I became friends earlier in the year. Before long, we found ourselves doing races together. And, Russell, so glad to have you on the Sports Exchange here on the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel and across our uh, networks as well. Just to let you, everybody know out there, the show can be heard. If you're not on the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel on iHeartRadio, Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcast. Russell, thank you very much for joining us. I know you're dealing with a few issues with your shoulder, so hopefully uh, uh, you'll take your mind off it for the, a little while, and we'll just talk some racing, all right? Absolutely. You know, if anyone's ever gone through uh, rotator cuff surgery, uh, having some issues with your biceps, et cetera, ligaments, then you know what I'm going through right now. So that's why I look a little... Uh, Little, uh, I don't know what you call me. Uh, I'm, I'm not my normal self, Scott, but uh, I'm in some good hands right now and got some cold water going through these veins here on top of my uh, shoulder. Oh, I know what your normal self is. I dealt with it firsthand at Talladega in Miami, man. You are running all over the place. You're having a lot of fun. And I got to tell you, Russell, it's been great working with you at Talladega in Miami. And I'm really looking forward to the Rolex 24 and the Daytona 500 next year. Obviously, we conquered the first two but now the rolex 24 is an event that i've been coveting for a while and of course everybody knows the daytona 500 and i don't think i can feel in my mind that i would feel more comfortable working with anybody but you russell i mean you know i enjoy the camaraderie that we have you know what i'm looking for and obviously you do everything in your power to make sure i get whatever i need to make sure we cover these races ex as extensively as we need to yeah you know those races would be very um historical uh, next year at Daytona, uh, bringing back, you know, they got a new class. We're bringing back the old GTP class as well. So from a Rolex 24 standpoint, a lot of cool things going on there. A lot of bringing back some of the historical uh, times that we had back in the 90s and the early 2000s, the old GTP class. Uh, and then, of course, when you talk about Daytona, it will be the 65th running of the Daytona 500. Plus, next year is going to be the 75th anniversary of NASCAR. So, There'll be a lot of things that will be talked about all throughout the year. Um, I'm really looking forward to that just because I'm a history buff and, and I love the, the history of our sport and just the history of motorsports in general. So being able to be a part of that, you know, will be pretty cool. Uh, but it's going to be a whole year celebration uh, that NASCAR will be doing, celebrating those first 75 years. You know, it started right there uh, on the beaches of Daytona, uh, Big Bill France Sr., is the one who put together the sport, put together a sanctioning body, took place there in the Streamliner Hotel, uh, just on A1A there in Daytona. So um, little did anyone know that way back when, whenever he created that and whenever he gathered all those folks together to create a sanctioning body and to create a, you know, a sanctioning body that would allow races to compete, you know, in the beginning in the Southeast to what it's grown today, uh, to racing all over the country, you know, next year going to be racing on the streets of Chicago. Uh, just a lot of cool things that will be going on to celebrate the 75th anniversary. Well, you know, my deepest gratitude to you for allowing me to jump in a stock car and ride around Homestead. To me, after I had the opportunity to do that, I never stopped talking about it. But I think the one thing I really learned about that experience is once you drive a stock car around a track like that, you gain a much better appreciation, Russell, for what a driver goes through, especially for several hours at a time. And in the time that I had an opportunity to do it, to me, you know, eclipsing 147.54 as my top speed, it was really something good, not only mentally, but for me to relate to a lot of people as I continue to do my deepest diligence to promote NASCAR. I mean, what few people have to understand that when you're promoting NASCAR, unlike the Indy cars, these are vehicles that go extremely fast and the in the everyday vehicles that you drive. And I think that's what made it such a very unbelievable experience. And that's, I have, I've been nonstop in terms of talking about it since you gave me the opportunity in Homestead. And I'm looking forward to doing a lot more good things as you and I get creative about what our intent is going forward. So with that said, okay. I, I, will, I, I will say this, Scott, and for those who may be watching right now, that if you want to do what Scott did and he was able to enjoy making laps around a NASCAR track, all you have to do is go to the NASCAR Racing Experience website. And that's what that's the car that you drove that day was a part of NASCAR Racing Experience. So uh, the great thing is about that is that it goes all across the country at different racetracks uh, in the southeast, 
the Midwest, et cetera. They go to Daytona. Uh, we have them at Talladega as well. So if you're looking to do something pretty cool, maybe for a Christmas gift, um, the NASCAR racing experience is a great way to do that, to let someone get in a car. You know, for those guys that, and, and those guys and gals who sit on the couch and say, hey, I could do that give them the opportunity to go out and see if they could do it, you know? And again, you won't be going as fast as, as drivers like Joy Logano and um, the guys that are chasing a, a NASCAR cup series championship, but you will get to have the experience of going pretty darn fast inside that car. And it will give you a little bit of a feeling of what it takes uh, to, to win in NASCAR. And it's a, uh, it's pretty cool, but uh, I would encourage you to do that. If you have never done that, look into it. NASCAR racing experience. Well, you know, I guess I held my own that first uh, that time, didn't I, Russell? Uh, you did, uh, but you you start out a little slow. But that's what everyone is supposed to do. You start out a little slow. You sort of see what you got, uh, get a feel of the racetrack, get a feel of the car, how the how yeah. the tires are adapting to the track, and um, you know these these guys that we see racing on Sundays and Saturdays in the Xfinity series, and and then sometimes Friday and Saturdays in the Truck series these drivers have been doing it for a long time and it takes a long time to be able to create a, a, a you know, very, very successful craft. And that's what they've been able to do over time. So, uh, but being able to jump into a car like that and uh, you know, you get some education, you get a little teaching from the folks there from the NRE and um, get behind the wheel and see sort of what you can do. Yeah, that was cool. All right. So let's, let's go on to the business at hand, Russell. You know, you really couldn't have any better tracks to promote when you deal with the fact that you have two races at Talladega, as I understand, right? You have one in Miami and a pair in Daytona. So how do you manage such an undertaking knowing that you have five races, and especially two that I consider bucket list? And Miami is a good track. Let's not take that for granted either. But that's a huge undertaking that you have, Russell. You know, and I know the amount of work that you do in terms of getting the releases out and what you do the day of the event. But the floor is yours. Well, I think, you know, I've been privileged to to work in the sport. Believe it or not, this January will be 37 years in some shape or fashion. Um, so not too shabby for a, a kid that grew up loving it, kid who grew up a mile away from Darlington Raceway, um, you know, going into the grandstands in the, in the 1970s and watching, you know, great names like Bobby Allison and Daryl Waltrip and, Richard Petty, uh, Benny Parsons, Kel Yarbor, my hero, David Pearson. Um, not too shabby to be able to say that you've worked in a sport that you grew up loving as a kid. Of course, the sports change a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's not, you can't, people always com try to compare drivers of today from two decades ago or three or four decades ago. It's hard to say, you know, who's the greatest driver of all time. Um, some will argue it's Richard Petty. Some will argue that it's Jeff Gordon because in his era, there were more competitive cars. Uh, some will argue about myself, David Pearson. You know, he only ran for the championship four times and won it three times. So comparing the sport today to where it used to be is very, very hard to do because it's just totally different eras. Um, the, the main constant has been that it's been great competition. Uh, every driver is out there to win. Um, it's been great for the fans. Uh, from an entertainment perspective, you go out there and you get to see the greatest racing that there is on the planet uh, at these racetracks. Um, you know, they're daredevils. The, the guys behind those wheels, they're daredevils and they're out there to win. They're, they're paid to win. Their sponsors are paying them to win. Um, so, again, the constant has always been super competition, super fun for a family. Um, and, and that's what it's always been about. For me personally, to be able to say that you know, for the last two and a half, almost three years now that I've headed up communications for Daytona International Speedway, uh, which is, you know, the host, the Super Bowl of our, our sport, the Daytona 500, also hosts the biggest sports car race in the country with the Rolex 24. Uh, and just what that racetrack is meant to the sport of NASCAR uh, and other motorsports, motorcycles, et cetera. Then to have Talladega Super Speedway, which is the fastest speedway that there is on the planet, um, greatest competition, always the most lead changes. Uh, sometimes I wonder why we even have seats in the grandstands because the fans are always standing up. Uh, so be able to, to say that track is part of my, my trio of venues is pretty cool. And then to have Homestead, uh, which to me is the best one and a half mile track that there is in our sport. Um, not only for the competition on the track, but for the beautification of it as well. 
Um, it really is a, a diamond in the rough down in South Florida uh, for a lot of folks who've never been there before. Just to be able to go out and see the colors of the racetrack, you know, pretty greens and pinks and oranges. And um, it, it really showcases the culture of what Miami is. Uh, and then there are things to do on the outside the track and the inside the track that gives it that South Florida flavor. So um, I would say, yeah, I would say, you know, the, the fact that I've got three tracks uh, is pretty cool. Uh, is it, it is it a lot of bouncing around? No doubt. Um, but um, it, it, there are three great, great venues. Each has a distinctive character. Yeah. So when you talk about the undertaking of all three, do you just find that the that the when I talk about undertaking of all three tracks, Russell, what I mean is, do you think it's just the adrenaline rush and your passion for it? Doesn't means that you don't care how many hours a week it is uh, for each of those events. You just want to make sure that you make every moment count because I know that's a lot of work that you put into. I've seen you on race day and beforehand, and you have a lot of stuff you have to do between sponsors. And, you know, the pre-race stuff, you know, but that's a big undertaking for someone like to let alone three of those tracks. Well, it's a big undertaking in any type of sport that you might be in, you know, in professional sports, there is, there's a lot of things to do. Um, the great thing is, is that there are team members that we have um, across the board from a NASCAR communication standpoint. We also have some track uh, you know, marketing folks that go to all three of those racetracks. Uh, so uh, the, the majority of the teams that go is from a, from a track standpoint, we may have this, a lot of the same guest services people that go to those three tracks, the same marketing people that goes to those three tracks, the same ticketing people. Um, and me being the PR person, I go to all three, but I always have some support from the NASCAR communications folks as well. I'm not sure who those will be at each track, um, because those folks go to different tracks as well. So um, I think it's just, uh, listen, anytime you're putting on a major sporting event, you know, it's a big deal and it's a big undertaking, but it's it's what you've been trained to do. Um, I'm sure that, you know, when, when the NFL, they get ready for the Super Bowl, um, they have there's a lot of pressure on them to make sure everything goes right. At the end of the day, you want everybody to be happy. You want – every fan that comes to that racetrack, you want them to be happy. You want them to have a great experience. You want them to be able to come onto the property with ease, get out of their vehicles, go to the, the fan zone, enjoy some entertainment, enjoy some refreshments, some food, then go to the grandstands and be able to watch some incredible racing, have a great time there. Whenever they leave, it's easy for them to get in their vehicle and to go home without any, any problems. And they leave with a taste in their mouth that says, boy, we can't wait to come back. Um, that's from a fan perspective. You want the same thing from the competitors. You want the competitors to leave and say, boy, what a great race weekend this was. Those folks at Homestead Miami Speedway or Daytona or Talladega, they put on a great show. Uh, they were ready for us. Um, the same thing with our sponsors, the same thing with the media, everybody who comes, we want them to have a good time and we want them to come back. We want them talking positively about the venue that, that they just came to see a race at. Um, and on the flip side of that is from a television standpoint and from a radio standpoint, from a social media standpoint, for those folks who couldn't be there, we hope that it's an incredible race. They get an appetite and want to come to a race at that particular venue or They'll tune in again the next year. They'll tune in again to more races that NASCAR is hosting. You know, we have great partners with Fox and, and NBC and have had since 2001. Um, they do a lot for our sport to promote it. And for those folks who, who can't get to a race, whether it's, you know, they can't travel from two hours away or they can't travel from California uh, to Florida, or to Alabama, um, they get to watch it and they have a great experience. So um, there's there's a lot of ways that we all want to make sure that that race goes off without a hitch. It's great competition. It's great experience for the folks that are on site, but also for the folks tuning in, you know, it gets their gears going as well. It's a great segue, Russell, where I'm going to go now. Okay, so let's describe what fans can look forward to as far as racing goes at these remarkable venues. So to me, each of these venues seems so different than the other. Don't you? you have, obviously, the Homestead track. We all know 
about the big speeds you have at Talladega and, of course, Daytona. So I'll repeat the question so that way you can make sure that you understand where I'm going with it. First of all, okay. describe what fans can look forward to as far as racing goes at these remarkable venues, Talladega, Daytona, and Homestead. Well, again, each each has its own characteristics. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about Homestead, Miami, and the fact that it's it's in a great location. Um, you're 40 minutes away from center Miami. Um, great things to do outside of being at the race. You can go to Miami and do a lot of other things. Great food, great cuisine, um, great places to go. Uh, while you're there in town to go to an event at the racetrack, um, you, it has that South Florida feel. Uh, and again, once you get on the property there, you will feel welcome. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You'll feel welcome. Um, Homestead to me is a great driver's racetrack. Um, you know, with the new next gen car that produced incredible numbers this year, incredible records and statistics going to a place like Homestead, really showcases a driver's ability to be able to manhandle a race car. And um, Kyle Larson did that just a few weeks ago. Um, he's known for that, and he proved it again there at Homestead. It's a great proving ground. Um, so Homestead, again, has its own characteristic. Um, it, it's nice to be able to win at that racetrack just because of the – from a competition standpoint, the teams and the drivers, when they put that – when they look at the schedule on that event, they put a check mark by it and say, hey, we really, really want to win that race because of how the racetrack is, how it's a driver's racetrack, how it's a team racetrack. Everything has to click. And so that gives it its own characteristic. You know, and also, too, for years and years, um, Homestead hosted the, the Cup Series Championship weekend there for 19 mm -hmm. years straight. Right. So there's a lot of history there, even though that racetrack – did not host NASCAR events until 1995. There's a lot of history that's been poured into it in that short amount of time. So um, Homestead has its own characteristic. When you talk about Daytona, the word Daytona says it for itself, really. Um, and the same can be said for Talladega. Right. But, but Daytona um, has become the Super Bowl racetrack of our sport. And not only is it because of the Daytona 500 leading off the year that every driver wants to win, it's also been in recent years, it's been the final race, uh, the, the Coke Zero Sugar 400 has been the final race before the playoffs begin. So that race has set the field for the playoffs. So a lot of importance on, on both of those races. But again, Daytona was built, first race was, was held back in 1959 and NASCAR started, again, on the beaches of Daytona. Big Bill France wanted something different, something new. Other racetracks were – small tracks were built you know, up and down the southeastern coastline. He wanted something different. He wanted something fast, and that's what he did. He built a two-and-a-half-mile racetrack with 33, 33 – uh, excuse me, 31 degrees of banking. And lo and behold, the first Daytona 500 was held in 59 with Lee Petty winning it. And it has just become over the years the Super Bowl of our sport. Again, it's sort of some some people will say it's strange the fact that the Super Bowl race is always the first race right. compared to other sports where it's always at the end in football. Um, but that's just the way it developed. And a um, lot of history, a lot of tradition there. Um, it is, and it's not just in in the United States; it's across the globe. Right. So, uh, from a historical standpoint. And knowing the drivers who have won the Daytona 500, knowing names like, you know, Richard Petty, a seven-time winner, Dale Earnhardt, who finally got his one win in 1998, Daryl Waltrip, Bobby Allison, Benny Parsons, Buddy Baker, the net Fireball Roberts, Junior Johnson, the names go on and on and on of pretty much every name that I just said are, are either in the Hall of Fame of NASCAR or they're going into the Hall of Fame. Uh, of NASCAR. Um, it, it breeds, um, uh, success and it also showcases talent like we've never seen before. Um, it's a different brand of racing. It's drafting. 
Um, it is, it is, you know, for years and years, if you wanted to win Daytona, sometimes you had to be in second position on the final lap to make a slingshot move. Um, those were notorious, uh, back in the seventies, uh, and really through the mid 1980s or so. Um, but Daytona is much more than NASCAR. It's, it's sports cars, it's motorcycles. Um, we run go-kart races there, national championships. There's where we have all kinds of different car shows. We have concerts there. We have soccer tournaments there. Um, it is, it is a place that hosts a lot of events throughout the year that are non NASCAR. Um, but they are supported by a host of different people. And, um, so again, it's, it's become, it, it's become really its own mammoth venue. Uh, in addition to NASCAR, again, it was built for NASCAR racing, but it's turned into much, much more than that. Um, you know, you can look at the pond inside of Daytona. Where else can you find a racetrack that's got a big pond, a fishing pond inside of it? Um, a lot of the dirt that was used to create that pond went into the banking there at the racetrack. So uh, a lot of cool, a lot of cool things there. Talladega, uh, a lot of people would say it's very similar to Daytona. It, it, it might be in a way, but in reality, it's not. France wanted to build something that was even bigger than Daytona. So he built a 2.66 mile track build it two degrees more as far as the banking it's 33 degrees and actually build it wider so cars can go at daytona over 200 miles per hour bumper to bumper at three and four wide with no problem if you hold your line uh sometimes those guys haven't been over the hold the line and they get into a wreck and it's called the big one uh you may have two cars in it five cars in it ten cars in it uh that get into a big wreck and sometimes the drivers get a little perturbed because they feel like that someone else created a wreck and took them out uh, and they didn't really have anything to do with it and there was nothing that they could do about it but mm -hmm. um, Talladega is known for being the most competitive racetrack we have the most lead changes pretty much every year um, like I say fans and the crowds are always on their seat they're out of their seat standing up cheering um, the infield is over 240 acres and it is we have a little bit of everything um, for fans in the infield. It's for uh, the fans who want to have a good time. Uh, we have Talladega Boulevard um, and that's it's a, it's a great party place. But we also have great camping areas inside for families that don't want to be near that area. It's so big. We, we can mark off different areas in the racetrack to make it where any kind of fan, whether you're young, old, like to party, don't like to party. We've got areas in there for camping, and uh, we're known for camping. It's um, probably about right at 3,000 acres as far as how much property that there is there at Talladega. So camping is huge for us. Um, we, we really enjoy the fact that we've got uh, Oxford, Alabama, not too far down the street, Anniston, uh, Pell City, and, and Birmingham, not too far away. So those that don't want to camp, we have hotels and stuff in those areas, great restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. But um, Talladega is a, is a, we've had a lot of fans that have been going there and I've been there now for 10 years. We've had a lot of fans that have been going there for years and years. And a lot of them will tell you they ha they've got the same RV spot that they had 20 years ago. And most cases, their neighbor has had the same spot 15 to 20 years as well. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like a pilgrimage. Everyone comes together uh, once or twice a year and they all get together and, They've, they've become friends at the racetrack. They didn't know when they didn't know that that neighbor until they met him at Talladega. And so for years and years now, that's what they do. They all get together and come to Talladega for a great race, uh, great place to have fun. And, and again, from a competitive standpoint, there's nothing better than the racing at Talladega. Yeah, my first impressions were I knew it was big and it kind of reminded me a little in a certain sense of Indianapolis because it's a very big place, too. But but again, you know, and I've been to Indianapolis a couple of 500s and a brickyard 400. So I can speak from experience. They have, a, they have road courses in there, golf course and so forth. 
But to me, I'll know how to handle Talladega the next time. I stayed in nearby Oxford at the last minute when there was a quick cancellation. So I'll know the lay of the land. Unfortunately, in my situation, when I went up there. I'm trying to mix and match my bio week with college football to get up there on short notice. But it was a blast. Don't get me wrong. But I'll be a little bit more prepared the next time up there. But, no, it's a fascinating track. And I remember watching it on TV because of the action. And the guy I used to watch was – Ken Squire and Buddy Baker as the announcers. I said, I need to get to this place one day. And lo and behold, a few weeks until we pulled it off. So, all right, we're going to go on to the racing part of the broadcast, okay? okay? I wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to go over the venues that you represent. Okay, so we're going to talk about 2022 champion Joey Logano. Explain the magnitude of the person and accomplishment. My experience with Joey was fantastic when you had that media availability. We're in the next gen because I know he became the 17th driver to win multiple titles. And I know he's worked with Joe Gibbs as well. So, but to me, what Joey did is, he, and you know what, the one I love about NASCAR drivers compared to some other sports, these are just down to earth athletes that to me don't have many big egos and they talk to you like human beings. And that's one of the things that fascinates me. And I've been covering NASCAR for many years, going to a lot of different venues, but we'll keep on point with Joey Logano. Talk about the magnitude of the driver and his accomplishments. Anything you want to add light to? Well, you know, Joey has, he's won a lot of things in the sport. Um, not only the, the two championships now, again, closer to home for me, he's won three of our Talladega races. Uh, he's won the Daytona 500. Um, and he came along. I don't know if you remember, they gave him the nickname Sliced Bread. They thought he was the next big deal. And his, his time at Joe Gibbs Racing was not that great. He did win a race. He won a race at Loud, New Hampshire, and he, he, he fell into it. He didn't win. It. Everyone was pitting for gas, and it started raining. And so that's really how he won that race. But he never really performed there like, like he has shown that he could. You know, and sometimes that is just, you know, it's chemistry. Uh, it could be the fact that, again, he was young um, and green and – you know, he needed some time to get used to those cars. Um, but it was, you know, a lot of people were surprised whenever he got the ride over at Penske um, after basically he was told he wasn't going to be coming back to Gibbs. But um, the, the great thing about our sport is, is that the drivers, they're, they're just like you and I, you know, they're, they're just regular people. And they just happen to be able to, to turn left no one hit the brake and, and no one to have the gas, you know, all the way down through the floor. Right. Um, I think he has been, he's been great for our sport because he'll rub fenders with someone. He doesn't care what anybody says or thinks. He doesn't care if he gets booed. Uh, he doesn't care that another driver gets perturbed with him. Um, he's going to do whatever he thinks he's got to do to win that race. You know, that's what Roger Penske pays him to do. And, um, he'll tell you, you know, he'll, he may tell you that he doesn't have a whole lot of friends off the racetrack. Um, right. If you go back in time anyway, most drivers and stuff in the seventies and eighties, they didn't really get along either. Um, um, there are some friends out there today, but Joey Logano is not in the, he's not in the business to try to make friends out on the racetrack. He, you know, he'll tell you all he wants to do is win. That's all he's ever wanted to do. He really hadn't had any hobbies other than racing. Um, and I think he's been great for the sport because of his attitude that I'm, I'm out there to win. And, and if you get in my way, I may punch you. Um, so, you know, there are, there, there are drivers that fans love and there are drivers that fans hate. That's been the way it, it, it's been that way since the beginning. Um, yeah. isn't it weird how in the 1970s, most fans despise, my old pal, Daryl Waltrip, they despised him. You know, here he was, he was this young guy from Franklin, Tennessee, and he comes around and he starts outrunning the heroes of the sport, like Petty and Pearson and Allison and Yarbrough and Parsons and Marcus. And a lot of fans did not like him because he would run his mouth and say, I don't care what their name is. You know, I'm, I'm here to beat them. And for many, many years, fans hated him. Then fast forward, 
to the the early nineties or whatever, he wins a couple of the most popular driver trophies. Um, so it sort of came full circle. Um, and maybe that's the way it is when drivers get ready to retire. Uh, there's been some others that have happened that way as well, but I think Joey Logano has been great for the sport just because he, he, he allows there to be some question marks, uh, near the end of a race. Um, I mean, I can tell you this, What's it would have been interesting to see had he been second late in that race at Phoenix, just say they had a bad pit stop. Yeah. And he was behind um, Chastain. Who knows what would have happened? I can guarantee you this. Chastain would have got the bumper put to him. Would it have spun him out? Would it have just got him loose or whatever? I don't know. But um, Joey's got that mentality. I'm there to win. And if I got a car that can do it, and if I got a driver who's slower than I am, and he's blocking me or he's not letting me around, I'm going to find a way. So uh, I think he's been great for the sport. I really, really do. And, um, you know, he'll be a hall of famer for sure uh, within NASCAR's hall of fame. Uh, that will just be, you know, when the time comes, he'll be going in. Yeah. I mean, 17 different driver to win multiple titles says a lot when you can do it more than one time. All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Russell, and I got plenty to put you on the spot, but this is one of my favorite questions. Okay. Rich, I'm going to go in order. Richard Petty, Aaron Hart Sr., Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, rank them. And if you can't rank those, okay, I, I'm going to do what they do for me when I have to take a test. I'll give you an other that you can add. Fair enough? Because I I've see. taken enough multiple choice tests. I, I, again, but, as I said earlier, you know, eras and stuff make things a lot different. So you said Petty, yeah. uh, Dale Aaron Hart Sr., Hart Sr. Jeff, Jeff Gordon, Gordon Jimmy, Jimmy Johnson, Brown. and who else? And then you can go other. I'll give you an opportunity to throw somebody in there. Well, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I, you know, um, as you can see by my hat, <laughs> this is an old school hat, Scott. I um, I grew up a David Pearson fan, um, so I was around all throughout the 1970s whenever he was winning races for the Wood Brothers. You know, he would he would win, you know, 11 out of 16 races one year and he won 11 out of what 18 races another year because the wood brothers only ran the the big money races uh, they did not run for the championship back then but um number one with me is always going to be david pearson because he only ran for the championship four times and won it three he won one out of about every five races that he competed, almost 20%, just over 19% was his winning percentage. So, um, and I knew him very, very, very well. Um, got to know him as a child, got to know him even better as a, um, as I grew up in life, I actually worked for him for a year. Um, dream come true for a, a young man. And, um, and then after that, when I started at Darlington in the nineties, I, my relationship with him just got better and better and better. And we became very, very good friends. So he became, he was my hero. But then after you, you know, years later, you become friends with someone and you realize, you know, he really wasn't my hero. Uh, he, he was a guy I pulled for, et cetera. But then I got to know the man very, very, very well um, throughout the rest of my life. And, you know, he actually asked me to help induct him in the NASCAR's Hall of Fame whenever he went in in 2011. And so myself and Leonard Wood actually inducted him, co-inducted him. And it's one of the proudest moments of my life. So for me personally, I'm going to say number one is the Silver Fox. Okay. Um, number two, um, again, I'm old school and I love all these guys that are on the list. Um Heck, I did something with Richard Petty I've never done before in my life just because I wanted to. But back in, in um, at Daytona in August, I actually had someone send me a picture that they had taken of me and Richard from back at the Daytona 500. He did some, some publicity stuff for me on race morning, and someone had taken a picture, and I actually got him to autograph it for me just because I never had that before. Um, so it's really hard to – to, to go the rest of the way. Dale Earnhardt was a very dear friend of mine. 
Um, Jeff Gordon is, is, has been great to me over the years. And I think he's won an incredible talent. But if I had to go the rest of the way, I'm going to probably go um, – I'm going to probably go Richard Petty next, two. I'm going to go Earnhardt, three, Gordon, four, and Jimmy, five. Gordon, Again, four, and Jimmy yeah, five. You know, everybody has their own opinions, you know. I know that. Hey, Russell, I, I've been covering major league sports for a lot. We have these things called Mount Rushmore's and Vives. Do you think I was going to really make this question easier? Come on. How long have you dealt with me? Listen, in my opinion, Russell, there are no wrong answers. I was just kind of curious to get where your mind. And when I, and I had a feeling you were going to put Pearson when you tipped your hat earlier before we came on anyways, <laughs> that he was somewhere going to be in that number five. That's all right, Russell. Yeah, I, think, I, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of um, people in our sport, they know that of my relationship with him. I mean, a lot of media, if they ever need to know anything about David, you know, we lost him just a few years ago, but anyone who never needs to know anything about him, they, they'll call me and ask me, or if someone calls the family, uh, Larry Pearson, who was a two-time Bush series champion, is one of my dear friends and his son, they'll call me. That's their call Russell. He'll know. Um, so that just shows you my relationship with him was, was, uh, was really incredible. And, um, the, the, the thing about him is I, I miss him as the person a lot more than I do as the race car driver because of the relationship that I had with him. So I, I, I miss the phone calls. I miss, uh, seeing him, talking to him. Um, that's, that's the things I, that I miss more than anything else is, is him all for the racetrack. So Russell, I know we're going to have a little bit of a female audience here, so there's no way that I can avoid not asking you this. <clears throat> What are your thoughts about Danica Patrick's career? I know the one thing about Danica, she had money. I mean, Tony Stewart backed her and she had an awful. Do you feel that to some extent, Russell, she underachieved with the resources that she had? Because I know she was a competitive young lady, but, you know, I know that Richard Petty had some choice words for her that, you know, we all know that she's an attractive young lady that she should have won a lot more races. Well, <laughs> I can go back to sort of what I just said a few minutes ago about Joey Logano at, at Joe Gibbs racing. A lot of people probably expected him to win a lot more whenever he was there, but it just didn't happen. Um, sometimes the chemistry is not right. Sometimes there, there are different factors that make it where something's not right. Now, someone could just say that, yes, she should have won. She should have won more. She should have did this. She should have done that. Again, I wouldn't – none of us are in the confines of that – the walls of that shop, um, at, whether it be at Junior Motorsports or it be at, at, at um, Stuart Haas Racing. Um, you know, you can look at – I mean, let's look at the last couple of years for Stuart Haas Racing. I mean, how many drivers – I mean, Clint wasn't winning at the end of his career there. Right. Um, you know, the, the general, uh, Custer – He's, he's had one race win there. I mean, and, you know, Eric has had a few wins, a couple here and there. But my, my point is, is that it's very hard to win today. And you have to have the right everything. You know, not only does it have to be the right chemistry, but you also have to have the right luck. You also have to have the right time when a caution comes out. There, there's so many factors that come into play today. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the things that I do like about Danica's um, entry into our sport was that she was able to take it to some places that it hadn't been before just because of her name, her success that she had when an IndyCar race. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't really look at it that way. I don't really look at that as a failure. I look at it as she gave it her best shot. Things just didn't happen to, to, to go her way. Um, you know, I, I look back to the mid seventies when Janet Guthrie was in our sport, her coming into NASCAR gave NASCAR a look that it had never really had before until her, um, you know, she goes and tries to run the, the Indianapolis 500 doesn't make it because of mechanical failures in qualifying and humpy Wheeler is able to lure her down to Charlotte for the same race weekend and run in the world 600 today the coke 600 um and she finishes 12th 
in her first race ever. Hmm. Now go figure that one out. Uh, now granted she was many laps behind uh, a lot of cars had fallen out, et cetera. But how do you do that? You've never driven a stock car before. You're in an Indy car. Can't make the field there because of, of engine woes. You're lured to Charlotte. You make the race and you finish 12th. You've never even driven a stock car before. So I guess it's all dependent on how you define success and failures. Um, I would have loved to have seen if Janet Guthrie could have had money behind her uh, to see what kind of talent she had. I, I got to meet her one time. Uh, she was such a, she's such a very, very nice lady. Um, and she knows her stuff about motorsports. I would have loved to have seen what she could have done. Uh, and there were some drivers about it. Even David told me, um, he said, I th- she's got talent, but she never got the, the opportunity to, to get in better equipment. And then even if she did, who knows what would have happened with circumstance and chemistry and everything else. But I know that's a long winded answer, uh, on Danica. I think Danica, again, put us in a lot of places from a publicity standpoint and promotional standpoint. I thought she was good for the sport, you know, because she put us places that the sport hadn't been in many, many years. Fair enough. I mean, you know, let's face it, though, she did have a fair amount of money. Tony Stewart believed in her. You can't have a better person to believe in you than Tony Stewart. We all know about his success. We don't have time to get into that tonight because we have a lot more ground to get to. But, you know, more power to her. She's still involved, I know, as a broadcaster as well. And, of course, I know NASCAR is breaking barriers with Bubba Wallace, certainly having some success (laughs) there as well. You know, so how important is it for Bubba Wallace to continue to have success as you not only have a lot of the current drivers, female African American slash minorities, and of course, you know the good old boys as they're considered. Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, the, our sport's been the same really since the beginning. The fact that if you have success, you remain in it for a long time. If you don't, you probably won't sustain a long position within the sport. Right. Um, at the end of the day, you have to win. Um, you know, Michael Waltrip is a great example of someone that was able to stay in the sport for a long, long time before he finally won a race. And I think I think Michael was able to do that because he was so good off the racetrack right. at promoting products. I mean, for years and years before he ever won races, you know, he was utilizing all forms of different advertising by different companies who were sponsoring him. They would never win the race, but buddy, he could push product off of a shelf. So, um, you know, and then eventually he, he started winning some races and uh, that kind of thing. So that, that normally is not how it happens that you, you're able to stay in the sport for such a long period of time, but his sponsors were perfect for him and, and he was able to make it work even when they were not winning. Um, you know, the, the good thing about Bubba is now that, you know, and race wins are very, very hard to get. In the last two years, Bubba has got a win. Um, and and that, that's great for our sport. You know, me working at Talladega, I've, I've worked with Bubba now. I worked with him, shoot, probably eight or nine years now. Um, back when he first started in the truck series. He, he's, he's from Mobile, Alabama. So um, got to know him very well. And he's helped us out a lot at Talladega uh, with different promotions and uh, he's gone with us on the campus of Auburn before. He's, I mean, he's just done a lot of different things. He's come on an off day and, and gone and fed pizza to the staff at the racetrack one day. I mean, it's just really, really cool. Um, but I think it's great that he has had the success that he has had in the last couple of years uh, to be able to go to victory lane. Um, you know, Daniel Suarez, uh, again, from a multicultural standpoint, we're, we're garnering fans, you know, from Mexico uh, that, that follow Daniel. Again, what a wonderful kid uh, who's a darn good race car driver. Um, but if these guys, if they don't have success, you know, the question will be how long will they be able to stay in the sport? Because a lot of what drives our sport are, are you know, partnerships with companies and that kind of thing. Um it, it, it really is something that is very, very vital to our sport, you know, from a, from a sponsorship standpoint. So um, as long as those guys keep having success, as long as they keep attracting sponsors, um, I think they're going to be around for a long, long time. I really do. Um, and again, they've already proven 
that they can win. And again, you look at Daniel. Daniel, he wins a championship and stuff for Gibbs. They move up to Cup. He does nothing. They just they just couldn't hit on anything. And then for the last two or three years before he went to track house, he was really struggling going to a team that was, that didn't have the, the, the money. Um, but he, he stuck it out. So he was able to get on with track house. And again, a lot of people are like, well, who is track house? What is that? And it was a great move on his part. So he's been able to have some success. Bubba showed, you know, again, he had a, a, a team with Richard Petty Motorsports that didn't have a lot of backing. Um, even though he had a few second place finishes, he goes over to this team and he's able to win. And um, so it, it's good for the sport to have parity, first of all, in our sport where one driver's not winning all the races, but you have a lot of drivers winning. And it's also very, very good for us to have, from a multicultural standpoint, Bubba, um, who – who became the first winner uh, since Wendell Scott, uh, first African-American to win since uh, Wendell Scott uh, at Jacksonville um, back in the 60s. Right. Um, I, I think it's really, really good for our sport. We're, we're garnering a lot, new, a lot of new fans, and that's what we're striving to do here. And uh, Daniel's come out with, with something. It's called Daniel's Amigos, and it's a group of folks, a group of folks uh, from Mexico and, and from different areas uh, from Latino descent that have – that come to support him and they have a great party and, and Daniel goes and visits with them. We wouldn't have that if Daniel Suarez was not in our sport. Right. And so it's growing and it's growing, it's growing. And so um, it, it's, it's a good time right now for, for new fans to be able to come in and see not only great competition, but I always said that, you know, we've always had great characters in our sport. Yeah. Um, Daryl Walter was a great character. Tony Stewart was a great character. Um, Bubba, Daniel, Logano, Ross Chastain, Denny Hamlin, these guys that, that um, they're not afraid to show their tempers and not afraid to show their, their desire to win. It's great having them uh, in our sport as well. So uh, I, I, think, um, I think we're in a good place right now. And, and we've got a lot of great young talent that's coming, following in behind the footsteps of a lot of these guys today. Um, Nick Sanchez just won the ARCA series championship he's actually from miami and uh so looking forward to having him and seeing some things that he's going to be doing next year in the truck series yeah i'm going to address i'm going to address a parody situation shortly so bear with me on that so i'm yeah. going to go i'm going to go rapid fire on a couple questions okay some of these right. are a little bit simpler than the ones that you've been hit with so but let's talk about russell the challenges in your first season with the back from COVID 19 will there be more direct access for drivers going forward. I know you were nice enough to arrange Cal Marola for me, you know, via a zoom call, but you know, like every reporter that covers the sport, I remember when I was doing Michigan a lot more in Phoenix and some of the other tracks that I covered, I was able to do more one-on-one -on -one dri drivers. And of course, now with the emergence of videos, that certainly only enhances our ability to keep it visual in addition to, the audio side, but I guess I'll repeat the question again, very slow. Okay. I, I, I think I got it. Oh, did Scott, you? I, okay. Just want to make I, sure. Yeah. I, I think that we'll continue to have more and more access to drivers with the media, also drivers with the fans. I mean, at Talladega, as you saw, we've got the Talladega garage experience. We've got four feet, a four foot fence in the building. That's all it, that's covered for the garage area fans can walk down a walkway and there on the other side of a four foot fence are the team cars, the pit crew getting it ready. The driver gets in there, buckles up and goes and fans have the accessibility to be able to watch that. Um, we have the same type thing in Daytona, same type thing at Richmond, same type thing at, at Phoenix and racetracks are looking at ways to be able to have the fans feel like they're more part of what's going on down inside the racetrack as well. In addition to media, um, I think from a media perspective, we'll continue to do things like zoom calls. I mean, it, it's a great thing where a driver can be in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he can talk to you on Tuesday of race week. Um, and you can do a one-on-one -on -one interview with him, just like you're talking to me right now. 
uh, and you can ask him specific questions and then you can put it to a story in a newspaper. You can use it on social media. You can put it on a podcast. You can do it on whatever social platforms that you have. Um, the, the one thing that COVID really made fly was Zooms, um, right. Zoom calls. Um, be quite honest with you, I had never really heard of that before. Um, you know, uh, so all of a sudden that happens. And the next thing that we're able to do, and NASCAR did a great job on doing this, getting drivers to be available to media to keep the sport out in the spotlight. And um, e-racing was another thing that NASCAR did that really helped NASCAR continue because there was no sports going on, if you remember, from middle of March until yeah. the middle of June. So I credit NASCAR a lot for that. Steve Phelps and, and um, Steve O'Donnell and all the folks at NASCAR – and their vision of what can we do to keep the sport in the eye of our fans and the media. E-racing came along, Zoom calls came along, NASCAR was able to be the first sport to come back to, to having events, even though there were no fans in the grandstands, mm -hmm. but we were able to have races at Homestead, the first race back there in the middle of June of 2020. Um, and we went, they finished the entire schedule. They ran the entire 36 race cup series schedule, the entire schedule with the Xfinity series and the truck series. And we're able to get all those races in, even though some tracks were closed, they moved those races to some other racetracks, but they made it happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I give them a lot of credit. I think a lot of that is it's all into one big ball of wax, but the driver availability piece that that won't stop. Um, that's the one thing that NASCAR has going for it that, that media and, and, and fans have much more accessibility to our athletes than some of the other sports do. True. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you, Russell, my first experience with zoom was actually with the Miami Marlins. It was, they're the ones that helped me get my feet wet with it. I was able to ask Don Mattingly lots of questions. They had player availability. And then when you came around to giving me the opportunity with Eric Almarola before the Homestead race, I was a little bit more comfortable with it than I ever had been before. But do you ever see a lot, any face-to-face -face interviews, or do you think from this point forward, you'll be relying more upon Zoom and teleconferencing to get them for the most part? Well, we, we still have a lot of that, you know, during a race weekend. Um, I mean, as you know, we, we brought in the majority of the drivers into the media center right? Um, where that's given, you know, will there be certain one-on-ones? Absolutely. Will there be group one-on-one -on -one sessions? Absolutely. That happened during our race weekend. And then we bring some drivers in there in front of a podium where everybody can get that driver all at once. So I think NASCAR has got a very good mixture and a very good blend right now of how we offer up our athletes to be able to speak to the media, to be able to speak to the fans through the media. Um, and then those opportunities for fans to be able to see drivers and, and and an athlete like they can they cannot do it anywhere it no, i can't even talk here like they can't do it any other property fair enough okay all right let's talk about your thoughts about the next gen enhancements in 2023 i know that was something you really wanted to talk about earlier you know so i think you could give the the, the our folks you know and, and i'm going to go over it one more time for those of you folks that are just joining us that this show can be heard on iHeartRadio, apple google or wherever you get your podcast. Otherwise, you can see it here on the South Florida Tribune YouTube channel. So thoughts about the next-gen enhancements coming in 2023? Well, I think NASCAR did an incredible job with that next-gen car this year. Uh, and I think the race results prove that. You know, five new winners uh, this year more lead changes than we've seen forever passes for the lead green flag passes throughout the field. Um, the competition this year was second to none. Uh, and it's all because of that next gen car. Now, just like anything, whenever you bring something on new, there are going to be issues that, that you're going to have to deal with throughout to try to perfect them. Um, of course, there were some things that, that were talked about at the end of the year with, you know, with cars, um, you know, do we need to work on the rear suspension? Do we need to do this? You know, it, a couple of cars caught a fire and it shouldn't have been that way, et cetera. Those are all learning things that NASCAR, every time there was an issue, NASCAR would take that car back 
right. and they would tear it down and they would start from ground zero to look at that car and see what exactly happened, what triggered something to happen to that car to make it do that. And then what can we do to make it right for the next race and then for next year? So NASCAR has taken a hard look at some of the issues that they had here later in the year. Um, and they, they have implementing things and they're in, still implementing changes. They'll be working on during the off season. And I think next year will be even better. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine that next year could be even better than what it was this year, but I'm just telling you, um, I think we'll see it. I think we'll see more again. We'll see a lot winners next year that, that didn't win this year. Um, we'll see new winners. Uh, you know, can, can anyone, if I were a betting man, would I bet that Noah Gregson won't win a race next year? I would not bet that. Right. But I, you know, what I bet, you know, the rumor is that, that, um, that Ty Gibbs is going to move the cup. If he does, I wouldn't bet against him not win a race. Um, uh, it's, um, and do I think that Martin Truex Jr. is going to go another year without winning a race? I don't. Do I think, um, um, my, my boy Ryan Blaney is going to do the same thing and not win a race next year. I don't think so. Uh, so I, from, from a, someone asked me, um, about a year and a half ago, you yeah. know, what did I think about the next gen car yeah. that was coming in 2022? And I have been a race fan ever since I was really three or four years old. I'm 57 years old right now. Uh, so more than 50 years, I've been a race fan. I've been fortunate to work in it for almost 37. So I like to say I wear two hats. You know, right now, this is my, this is a fan hat. So there are some times when I wear a hat that's got a racetrack name on it. So I wear two hats. Mm -hmm. From a fan perspective, a year and a half ago, I told people that I was super excited about the next gen car because everything that I'd read about it, everything that I talked to people about, everything about it pointed us going in a, in a upward direction with incredible competition. It was going to level the playing field. Yeah. So I was excited about that. I was excited to know that, okay, if, if you get behind a car, you can pass him. Um, did we see that at every track? No, but we saw it at a lot of tracks and the race. And I thought this year was just really, really good racing. So from a fan perspective, I, I was all about it. I thought this year was great. Um, I, I think that NASCAR really, really took a chance and going out and, and trying to see if this new car would work and it paid off. I give you know, Steve Phelps and Steve O'Donnell, the, our leaders at NASCAR, you know, who would have, who would have thought that we would have raced earlier this year um, in the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Yeah. I mean, who, who, who would have thought it? Yeah. That's incredible. So, so, so they took a chance. Let's take a chance and let's see what happens. And it was a home run. I mean, it was an absolute home run. Let's take a chance with this new car. Let's see what happens. It was a home run next year. Let's take a chance. We, we, roost, we, we used to run on a, on an oval there about 45 minutes outside of Chicago, but hadn't raced there in a few years now. Let's go back to Chicago, but let's try to race on the streets. Let's do what formula one's done. Let's do, let's do what IndyCar's done. Let's try it and see what we, what we get. So um, I give them a lot of credit for taking chances and taking chances in NASCAR though, is, is it's not something new. We talked earlier about Bill France senior building Daytona in 1959. It was a chance. They've been racing on the beach for years. Talked about Talladega being built in 1969 in between Atlanta and Birmingham off the interstate. Right. We're going to build a palace of speed. Well, will it fly? It sure did. So I give credit to those guys uh, and, and, and to the sport in general. Jim France, um, who is the son of Bill France Sr., uh, who is still very, very actively involved in so many things that is, that is done within our sport, within NASCAR and in IMSA. Um, I give him a lot of credit and, and the rest of the guys 
uh, that are at the controls of NASCAR for trying things. Let's see if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll try something new. But let's continue to make things the best that we can for our fans and keep making those attempts to make it best, as good as it can be for the fans, for the competitors, for the sponsors, for the television networks. There's a lot of pieces of the pie. And uh, I think this past year has been a very, very nice chocolate cream pie that's been delicious. Every slice has been good. All right, tonight, folks, as you know, the Sports Exchange, my name is Scott Morgan. I'm pleased to be joined by Russell Branham. Russell Branham works in communications and is a track historian for the Daytona International <coughs> Speedway. And of course, we know Talladega Super Speedway, and he also works with Homestead. Well, I got a few more questions I want to get to, Russell. Hang with me. You're doing great. Uh, my main objective tonight is to make sure everybody gets a very good education on NASCAR, and I think we're doing a whale of a job. I want to get to a couple more important subjects, if I may. All right. Okay. <laughs> First of all, as you alluded to earlier in the broadcast, Russell, the series is go going younger. 22 of the 36 races, 61% were won by drivers under the age of 30. Now, I have to tell you something funny, Russell. When I went there that Tuesday, okay, and it's been a while since I covered NASCAR, you know, dating back, you know, I had covered some races over at the final race of the year over at Homestead, like 10, 12 years prior. Yeah. You know, I wasn't really used to computers looking up stuff. So I had to get reacquainted with the drivers a little because a lot of them had turned over. R Rusty Wallace is now out. A lot of them are retired. But let's talk about these series getting younger. How important is it for the sport, knowing that once again, 61%, 22 of 36 drivers, one under the age of 30 that tells me that this sport has one bright future that's the that's exactly what the point of it is um you know you've you've got it's a little bit different than it used to be um you know you've got a lot of drivers who are out there right now that are still competing i know the drive and kevin harvick is still there to win uh, yeah. the drive and kyle bush is still there to win probably the drive for kyle bush right now is probably more than it's ever been because of sort of the way, you know, he he left Gibbs and, and he he's got a chip on his shoulder for next year and he wants to show people he made the right move going over to Tar C R. Um there are a lot of drivers out there that are super, super talented. Um and they're coming from all walks of life. They're not just coming up through a NASCAR chain. They're coming from different areas all across the country uh, and outside the country. So um, I think the future is in some great hands right now. When you talk about some of the young drivers, uh, you know, you look at the at the guys that were chasing the championship. Mm -hmm. um, Logano is not old by any means, but the other three, you know, with Chase and, and, and Chastain and um, uh, Mr. Bell, um, that's a lot of young talent out there and it sort of shows where the sport's going. And um, the good thing about two, when you go to this next gen car, it's relatively new for everybody. So right. if, if you've been a guy like Harvick uh, or a guy like Kyle, who've been around for a while, a lot of the notes that they've had over the years, it doesn't work anymore for this car. Same thing for those teams and those, those crew chiefs and those engineers who are putting those cars together. So, um, I, I think the future's bright. I do love, I do love it for the sport though. When some of the older guys can still show they can win, when Harvick still shows he's got it, when Kyle Busch still shows I still got it. Yeah, there's a lot of young guns out there, but I can still get it done. Um, and that's sort of the way it's always been. You go back. I, I mentioned earlier about Daryl Waltrip. You know, he was going against Pearson and Petty, and so they were in their forties. You know, and and Daryl was in his 20s, but yet he didn't care, you know, and he was he was still trying to make a, a name for himself. Um, it's great for the sport to have a variety of different drivers that are winning, a variety of different personalities, uh, a variety of different ages. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the future of our sport is going to be in good hands because there's a lot of good talent out there and there's a lot of good characters out there. I, next year is going to be pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing – uh, Noah uh, joined the ranks, the Cup Series. He will bring some excitement to it. I can guarantee you that. 
All right. Well, I got news for you. We're not done with our interviews. You and I, this is the first one. I expect us to do another one of these sure. before before we get uh, back to work in January. Sure. So, all right. Well, here, Let me talk about the National Football League for a moment. One of the reasons why the NFL is so popular is because of parity. And now we're going to talk about parity in NASCAR. I know we touched on it, Russell, uh, a few moments ago. But, geez, oh, Pete, when you have 19 different – race winners in a single season. If that is a parody, please define what the word is parody, Russell, because I didn't take a dumb pill overnight. Think about it. Most race winners, 19 in a single season, 19 out of what, 32? Is that correct? 36 races that we have. All right. And I'm sorry, and, I got off by four, but yeah, I, I was surprised that we, I was surprised we didn't see 21. I thought that Blaney would have won a race. And I really thought that uh, Martin Truex Jr. would have won one also. They both came close. They just didn't get yeah. it done there at the very end. But um, it is, it's a product of the next generation car. Um, it's going to be interesting to see next year. Listen, the, these race teams, after every race, they learn something new. And after a season, they learn a lot. So it's going to be very interesting to see how much they have learned from this year and what they will be able to implement as far as how they go about racing next year, as far as how they go about preparing these cars. Um, and look, everybody's looking for some kind listen, NASCAR has got a tight hold on the, on the rules, but every team out there, they're looking for some way to try to bend the rule, uh, to mm -hmm. try to make their car a little bit better than the other car. So um, you got some of the smartest minds um, as far as ingenuity um, that, that are, working for these race teams and their jobs are to try to make sure these cars can go the very, very fastest that they can go. So I'm anxious to see what they learn from this year. I'm anxious to see um, the, the changes that NASCAR will have in place for the cars to make them safer to make them more competitive. Um, it, it's going to be very, very interesting to see when we get to Daytona where we stand. And then once we leave Daytona, uh, once we get the, you know, the rest of the, the, the full season started, it's going to be interesting to see where we, where we landed at short tracks and, you know, medium sized tracks and such. Yeah. 19 of 30, still over 50%. And I, and I've had the opportunity to work covering IMSA races and did the 12 hours at Sebring, which is why I figure I'm ready to graduate to the 24 hour Rolex. But nevertheless, we'll move on to the next thing. Team Penske wins the ninth NASCAR national series title. I mean, let's face it, Rogers book, it's so long, we wouldn't have enough time anyways. But all he's done is win championships, both at Indy. Now he owns the Indy uh, Annapolis Motor Speedway. And it seems like he's owning NASCAR, winning nine National Series titles. Let's just put it in a nutshell really quickly. You know, Team Penske and Roger Penske. And what what, what can you say about Roger? I, I think that he is the epitome of class. I think he is the epitome of professionalism. I think he is the epitome of having the drive to win. Um, and the attitude that he has, it, it starts from him at the top and it goes all the way down to the bottom. Right. And I, I think his race teams are, you know, the only way he knows how to run a business, which he has many, many other businesses, right. uh, whether it's Penske rentals or the car business, uh, et cetera. The only way he knows how to do things is to do it, with the utmost of professionalism and do it right. And that's what he's done. Um, you go back and you look, you know, Roger Penske has been involved in NASCAR for many, many years. Um, you can go in that shop there in Mooresville, North Carolina, and you can look on the walls and you'll see pictures of Bobby Allison back in 1975, winning races in the AMC Matador, which was owned by Roger Penske. Right. You can see, Bobby Allison driving for Penske in the number two car, a, um, um, God, what was it? I'm trying to remember the sponsor of it, but I can't remember right now, but, um, he drove for, for Mr. Penske back when the Penske name was only synonymous in Indy car racing. Right. It was the cam cam Two Mercury was that sponsor of, of, of the Penske car in 1976. But, um, I just think that if there's, and we've got a lot of great car owners in our sport, right? But he just he's had so much success in IndyCar and in stock car racing. He only knows one way to do it, and that's the right way. He hires the people that he he feels like that can carry on, 
you know, that, that direction and guidance that he supplies. Um, he's very actively involved um, in the racing aspect of it. And buddy, oh boy, does he still want to win. Um, but he's been around a long time. It took him many, many years to finally win a championship. It took him many years to finally get a Daytona 500 win. Um, but he has solidified himself uh, within the sport of NASCAR and definitely within the whole gamut of motorsports in general for what he's been able to accomplish in, in, um, in Indy car racing, and also sports car racing as well. Let me give you a little mini FYI. I have a couple more questions and we should be able to wrap her up. Okay. okay. I was playing Little League Baseball in Metro Detroit in Southfield. He owned a Chevrolet mm -hmm. dealership and he was one of the sponsors of that team. And of course, my dad sponsored my team with all pro sporting goods. And I caught up with Roger later on at Michigan International Speedway and kind of joked around about it. But we had a, and Roger, every time I talked, was really class. And we always had a few laughs, but I always used to joke around. We really did get the best of you on the little league baseball diamond. We just laughed at it because, you know, he was a, he had a Chevrolet dealership in Metro Detroit. And it was just a lighthearted moment, you know, in NASCAR. There's never any shortage of those. All right. Let's talk about Jimmy Johnson pairing up with Richard Petty. You know, he's done the Sebring thing, you know, the 12 hours of Sebring, did the Indy 500. And obviously now Jimmy is back in NASCAR. So I think it's really great that you, you know, when you really had it, we, when we had some fun with our list here about top five that we talk about Petty and Johnson. Now these guys are pairing up and getting back into NASCAR. So how much of a boost is it going to be to have Johnson and Petty teaming up in NASCAR again? I, you know, I, I think Jimmy's Jimmy's got one goal in mind. You know, right now he's tied with Kale Yarborough on the all-time wins list. And I think that's what he's wanting to try to do is to try to make sure he can get out of that that tie with Kale uh, on the all-time win list for NASCAR. Um, you know, we talked a lot about it earlier. You know, the last couple years that Jimmy competed, he was a non-factor. Now, was it because that he and Chad Canals weren't good at their trade anymore? Did Chad Canals not know how to crew chief anymore? Did Jimmy not know how to drive anymore? Right. Absolutely not. Um, but sometimes you need a change. Even listen, Jimmy, uh, Jeff Gordon, and Ray Evernham had a gazillion wins with each other, won championships, won races. Then all of a sudden, they weren't winning anymore. So. Sometimes it's good to have a change uh, just to see what can happen. And um, I, I think it's a, listen, I will say this, um, that race team has gone through a lot of changes here in the last year. Right. Um, no one suspected um, Eric Jones to win at Darlington earlier this year. Um, but they've hit on something over there. And again, I think a lot of it is due to the new car. And they've hit on some things too. Um, I think Noah Gregson is going to be really good um, with, with as a teammate of Eric Jones next year. And Jimmy Johnson brings nothing but knowledge. I mean, incredible knowledge. And he also has in his pocket the attitude of we can win. Mm -hmm. And even though Eric won, a lot of people still don't really put that team up where they put other teams having Jimmy Johnson there will elevate that team. Um, so someone asked me the other day about Kyle Bush going over to Childress. I think Richard Childress, his race team just got elevated up to here because of Kyle Bush going to that race team. He will bring something to that race team that no other race car driver could bring. And um, so I think that, you know, we'll, We'll see where it all goes, but I'm I'm really excited to see Jimmy. Jimmy's coming back for a reason. Yeah, he needs another win, and he might need he he needs a couple more wins, and he can get by uh, not only Kel Yarborough but also Bobby Allison and Daryl Waltrip. So he's he's looking. Can I get a few extra wins to to get myself in front of those guys, and then? He, could, he would only be behind Richard Petty with 200, David Pearson's next, and then Jeff Gordon. He could he could possibly vault himself up in the fourth on the all-time win list. So we'll see what happens there. 
Yeah, I love your answer there, boy. If that doesn't add intrigue to NASCAR fans out there, but that one, I don't know. I, I, I what I enjoyed covering the Lions many years ago was watching Barry Sanders move up the rushing charts until he got to where he ended up doing. So one other question that popped into mind, and I have another one. Okay, do you think that NASCAR's never been safer than it is now? I know that once Dale Earnhardt Sr. passed away, they had the Hans of Ice and, of course, those foam walls. You know, because a lot of people wonder about the safety-related nature of the sport. Absolutely no question about it. Um, You go and you look at race cars from yesteryear, and you see the way the seats were. You see the way the, the belts were. Um, go into a Hall of Fame somewhere and look at an old race car. And, and, and then you look at what NASCAR has done today. And not only with the cars, but also with Safer Barrier at all the racetracks. Um, but, but building these cars to make them where they are safe. We have to make sure, when I say we, I, I'm, I'm talking about NASCAR. We have to make sure that the, the racetracks are safe for not only the drivers and the competitors, but also for the fans alike. And so NASCAR has, there is no telling how much money and resources that NASCAR has utilized over the years. And it's a continuous thing. It's not just, okay, here we go. This is what we've developed for this year. We're going for it. Nothing else. That is totally false because they are always looking at ways that they can enhance this sport from a safety standpoint. So do I think it's the safest it's ever been? Absolutely. I do. Um, um, will they continue to work to make it even safer? You better believe they will. Um, it, it is, it is a goal of NASCAR. It's always been the goal of NASCAR to make sure that, that people were safe when they were at a racetrack. Again, everybody, fans, competitors, teams, everyone who's there to make it, to make it safe. And they won't stop. They will continue. As I said, they're going to be working all during this off season. And when the green flag falls at Daytona, they're still working on it. When the green flag falls for the next race, they're still going to be working on it. Um, just to make sure that they feel comfortable about where we are. They, they're going to continue to do that. They're going to continue to work hard to do it. They're going to continue to have uh, hire people that are engineers that know things about cars, that know things about track walls, that know things about anything and everything where it concerns safety. They're going to keep working hard at it. I can tell you that right now. Well, I mean, having been given the opportunity to drive a car, thanks to you, I certainly had an opportunity to see it close to firsthand. I don't really get opportunities to talk about crew chiefs, but I will in this particular situation. Okay, Russell. Paul Wolf wins the 2022 NASCAR Cup Championship. What are your thoughts about Paul Wolf's accomplishment? I mean, he just had a lot of success with a lot with with various drivers. Um, it just shows you he is very methodical in his thinking. He's very good at being a crew chief today. There's a lot of there's a lot of different tactics to it, you know. First of all, you got to be a coach for your driver. You got to be to to calm that driver down, uh, manage uh, the race team during the race, make all the calls during the race, tell the crew exactly here's what we're doing. Um, and you know this, you know if a crewman doesn't do exactly what he's supposed to do, if one of them lets a tire get loose and it goes on pit road, pit road, he's going to be suspended for four races, which is the way the rules are today. Um, I think Paul Wolf is again. He's had a lot of success with with Brad Keselowski. Now he's had a lot of success with Joey. Um, there, there are a lot of great, great minds in our sport, uh, and he's one of them. He, the thing I like about him, he's always cool. He's always cool under pressure. Um, no matter if they're getting ready to win, or they're getting ready to to have something go wrong. It, it, the unexpected to him is common and it's normal and he's not going to, to go ballistic or whatever. Um, again, I think a lot of that comes from the top that comes from Roger Penske. I, if you look at a lot of the crew chiefs that are in over on the Penske side, they're all sort of alike. They're, they're sort of have a low demeanor to them, 
um, they're able to talk to that driver. They're able to explain, here's why we're doing this and make it where a driver and a crew can understand the methodology. Um, and he'll win another championship. Mark it down. Okay, Russell, I have to ask you this one last question. Okay, you ready? Uh -huh, sure. You've been handling everything fantastic. What keeps Russell Branham's motor going when you not only work this trifecta, Talladega, Daytona, and Miami, but just in racing? Do you? How long can you see yourself doing this? Do you think retirement is in your blood? Can you see yourself going five or ten more years? You're only 57 years old. And by the way, three years younger than I am. But when I see the energy and the personability that you have there and how much you love doing it, Everybody knows at some point retirement could be down the road, but how long can you see yourself doing it? What keeps the motor going for Russell Branham? I think it's just the love for the sport. Um, again, I've, I started going to races when I was what, three years old with my uncle, my uncle Ray, which is my dad's brother um, who's still living and still in great health and, we talk a lot all the time. Um, someone will call me wanting to know historical, uh, historical question. And I may say, let me get right back to you. And a lot of times it's me making a phone call to him because he knows a lot more than I ever thought about. And I'll say, Hey, do you remember in 1967, this happened? Well, he said, yep, I do. Here's what happened. And he can tell me. So I think that I think it's going to always be in my blood, no matter where, where I'm at. Uh, no matter where I go in my life, um, it's been not many people can say that they get to got to work in a sport that they grew up loving. Not many people can say that they got to help induct their hero into the NASCAR Hall of Fame um, like I was able to do with 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 David Pearson. And not many people could say that I've made so many great friends uh, within this sport. Um not just drivers, not just car owners and crew chiefs, but the people, whether it be media people, sponsors, um, fans. Um, I've been able to meet a lot of great people over the years. And I guess the reason I get along with them so, so well is because, you know, I've been a fan myself, you know, ever since I was you know, two or three years old. So um, you never forget where your roots are. And mine will always be in Darlington, South Carolina and Darlington, even though we didn't talk a lot about that one. Um, it will always be in my heart because I grew up a mile from it. I grew up going to every race there, you know, from what, 1968 all the way through the mid eighties, really before, just before I got into the sport and mm -hmm. started covering the race as a part-time sports rider. Right. I went to every race from the time I was three until my first race as a sports rider in 1986. Um, so <laughs> I went for a bunch of those races at Darlington, went to a bunch of races at Rockingham, which was only a, an hour away. Went to a lot of races at Charlotte, which was two hours away. Martinsville was 245 away. Um, so I went to a lot of events as a, as a child. So I guess what keeps me motivated is just my love for the sport. And at the end of the day, you know, I've always thought that it was the greatest sport that there was. My hope is that, that I've been able to at least have a hand in being able to promote it and to help people understand about it and, and what a cool sport it is. So whenever I'm dead and gone, that the sport continues to thrive. I'll have grandchildren that, that want to go to NASCAR races and I'll have great grandchildren that want to go to NASCAR races. So, um, so when you say what sort of pushes you, it, yeah. it's it's the it's the will to make sure that everyone out there knows what a great sport it is, and why they need to come watch a race. Um, I want it to survive for a long, long, long time, way beyond my years. Well, let me tell you, I've been in sports media, Russell, for forty three years. <clears throat> forty three years. And a lot of people don't realize, unless you get to know me, that, you know, they all look at me as a four major sport kind of guy, okay? But what I tell them, if you really want to get to know me, I have NASCAR and motor racing in my blood. It's that speed element that's inside of me. But more importantly, I think it's a passion that I get to talk with drivers that are down-to-earth, blue-collar 
athletes that drives me to want to promote this sport. And then when I run across PR people in the past, you know, I, I've had, I work with Michigan and Phoenix and well, it's a couple of other ones that just drives me more to want to pro promote the sport even more because I just feel like I hate to say NASCAR is the underdog of sports when you look at the major ones, but it is. And who wouldn't want to push for the underdog when you have such a relatively great set of people out there. And I think that's the one thing I like about it for me to spend, you know, time here, the, the better part of an hour and a half talking about NASCAR promoting you being generous with your time giving this. I want to make sure that when we get this stream done, which obviously we are live right now, then I get it every possible place that I can. And I'm going to work as diligently as I can to do it. And then we're going to get ready, obviously, after the first of the year, because we have more stuff to do. We have unfinished business to take care of. But when a guy like you, NASCAR to me should be appreciative to have an individual like you in this sport who, <clears throat> who bleeds the sport and promotes it as well as you. And I look at the sincerity of your answers plus the opportunity that we spent together at the track, they need more Russell Branhams. You know, they need a Xerox copier to go out there and photocopy you is what they knew. And, and I say this because I, I've had an opportunity right now to get to know you. You've gotten to know me as well. You know, I'm a very intense individual when I'm at the track and I'm only looking to do everything I can. Maybe I'm a little long winded at times, but you've already acclimated to that anyway. But we just, it's your acceptance of me mind of view, but more importantly, our common bond to promote a sport that we both have passion about. And that's why I'm so glad that we've had a great deal of time to talk about it tonight during the off season, because we've got time to get this thing out there. And I want to see this sport grow. I really, really, really do. And having a person like you spending time with me tonight, you know, I know you're dealing with a shoulder issue right now, but you've done a heck of a job, but you're just, to me, Russell, there aren't enough Russell Branhams to me in this sport. I, I know I know this is a small world, and with baseball and football being the two sports I probably promote the most outside of NASCAR, I've, had, I've met a lot of lifelong friends, but in the media per se, I've met a lot of, regardless of what four sports I'm in, but those are two I spend more time. It's a small world. But I'll bet you probably came across a guy by the name of David Poole many years ago, didn't you? Knew him very well. Sure yeah, did. I did. Knew him very well. I actually used to work with him in the Carolinas when I lived out there. It was unbelievable. They were nice people. We'll get into that tonight. I, I just figure that with you and I knowing common people like we do, it's just pretty neat when you have such a close knit group like you have, you know, and I know we've covered a lot of ground, but I feel like in my opinion, and you've known me long enough it, to me, if I can't do things thoroughly, I have no interest in doing them because I don't want to feel like we're shortchanging the objective that's at hand. And, and I think you've understood sure my decision to want to take this as far as we could probably take it. And sure. folks, after we're done with the sports chain, fire up Michigan is waiting for us. But any closing thoughts, Russell, about what any, that you want to add? I, I would just say I, I appreciate your kind thoughts there, your kind words. Uh, but I, I'll say this. There's a lot of great people uh, that work in our sport that we're all promoters. Um, the NASCAR comms team, the NASCAR marketing team, all of us. Um, and, and guess what? At the end of the day, pretty much anybody who works in our sport of NASCAR, someone may say, well, what's your job? My job is to sell race tickets. Right. If they ask, if they ask the, the, the um, marketing people, what's your job? It's to sell race tickets. If you ask the driver, what's your job? Your job is to sell race tickets because right. we need to be able to put, you know, butts in the seats uh, to sell race tickets to, to make our, our sport prosper. So, um, again, I appreciate the kind words, but just know there's a lot of people that, that are working in this sport to help promote it and to help make it where it's going to be around for a long, long, long time. But at the end of the day, like Bill France Sr. said, we're all ticket sellers. But again, thanks for having me on tonight. Well, all I can tell you, Russell, I know I've spoken to you tonight, but I hope you have an opportunity to introduce me to some of these kind of people and we can spend, uh, allocate a little time for them as well. But thank you very much. I really enjoyed the opportunity to do this, Russell. So, but once again, a special shout out to Candy Ebling. You know, she does a wonderful job at www.southfloridatribune.com and make sure that all the videos and the content gets up there in a timely way. But my name is Scott Morganroth, Motor City Madmouth. Please be joined by Russell Branham, who does handle the communications work as well as the historian history work for Talladega, Daytona, as well as Miami. And Russell, once again, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, a great holiday season. 
and I look forward to working with you and doing a lot more things next year. I, right now, obviously, I'm, I'm setting some time on my calendar for Rolex, Daytona, and then uh, with an opportunity to return to Talladega because you and I have a lot more work. And we're, we're just scratching the surface, my friend. And I think when I, we went out there and did. So meanwhile, on behalf of Russell Branham, my name is Scott Morgan, Rock the Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of the Sports Exchange. Immediately after this broadcast, we have Fire Up Michigan. Don DeRubis will be joined by Jeremy Ballreich and George Eichhorn. But meanwhile, what a great night here. And Russell, take care of yourself, my friend. We have more work to do. Thank you.